Welcome to the Great Detectors of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us over on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and give us a call, 208-991-4783. Well, before we do get started, I want to remind you, if you've not already tried Netflix, there's a world of great entertainment options. I just finished watching all of the Thin Man movies on DVD. There's a wide variety of great classic television shows and movies available in the Instant Watch library, including Mission Impossible, The Third Man with... Orson Welles, and much more. You can try Netflix out by going to netflix.greatdetectives.net or if you're in Canada, netflixca.greatdetectives.net. Well, today I'm going to bring you a story. This is actually a uh, sentimental favorite. It's the first Sherlock Holmes story I ever read. I was visiting uh, my grandfather's house and uh, they had a copy of... uh, book that just had the red-headed leg in it, so I sat down and I read it, and it was the first Sherlock Holmes story I enjoyed. Oh, whether you're listening for the first time, or you've heard and read the story countless times before, I hope you enjoy it as well. Here now is The Red-Headed League. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Once more, we're about to visit Dr. Watson, the friend and chronicler of Sherlock Holmes and his amazing adventures. We find him sitting in his well-worn armchair, an eager look on his face and a humorous twinkle in his eye. Can it be that the good doctor looks forward to his weekly appearances before the microphone? Good evening, Mr. Bell. It (laughs) certainly can. Tonight I have my narrative all picked out. Have you ever noticed that red-headed people always seem to lead very eventful lives? Look at Queen Elizabeth. Yes. And I've heard that Cleopatra was a brick top, and she certainly had very few dull moments. No, sure she didn't. Well, tonight I've decided to tell you the story... Of the Red-Headed League. The Red-Headed League. What a curious title. No more curious than the situation it gave rise to in Sherlock Holmes' life. And as soon as your word with our listeners is out, I'll begin. Good. Men, if you want to be a success in life, if you want to look like a success in life, remember that well-groomed hair means a lot to a man's appearance. I've heard so many men complain lately that the hairdressings they try are too greasy, too highly perfumed. I've heard them complain about those sticky goos which plaster their hair down and leave flaky residue on the hair. That's why I urge you to try Cremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic has just enough light oil to keep hair handsomely groomed, every hair in place with a rich, healthy-looking luster. And Cremel gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance, yet it never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. This is because Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. After you apply Cremel, just run your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. So tempting for the ladies to touch. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. Cremel always gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut look. As if your barber had just combed it. And it keeps it that way all day long. Be sure to try it, men. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the red-headed leak? Well, the adventure began one day during the autumn of the year 1890, I believe it was. It was just after my marriage, and I hadn't seen much of Sherlock Holmes lately. Anyway, I burst in upon my old friend to find him deep in conversation with a stout, florid-faced gentleman with the fiercest red hair... It has ever been my privilege to observe. I was about to withdraw when Holmes pulled me abruptly into the room and closed the door behind me. Come in, my dear Watson, come in. You couldn't possibly have come at a better time. But, Holmes, I was afraid you might be busy. So I am, my dear fellow. Allow me. Mr. Wilson, 
This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Sit down, Watson, sit down. Uh, thank you. I know that you share my love of the bizarre, although you've never agreed that for the strangest effects and most extraordinary combinations we must go to life itself. Well, you know, I... Uh, Mr. Feel... Japers Wilson here oh. has just started a narrative which promises to be one of the most singular to which I've listened for some time. Oh, really? And now, my dear Mr. Wilson, perhaps you would have the great kindness to recommence your story. Oh, certainly, Mr. Holmes. As soon as I can find that newspaper clipping... Where did I put it? And the sworn it was here in my waistcoat pocket. Uh, Watson, while we're waiting for Mr. Wilson to find his missing newspaper advertisement, uh, suppose you tell me what you deduce from his appearance. Oh, well, now, let me see. Uh, well, I would say that he was uh, middle-aged, if you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Wilcox, I hope, Wilson, and, uh, and he has red hair. Obvious, Watson. Too obvious. I'll come to your assistance. Oh, Colonel? He has at some time done manual labor. He is a Freemason, has been in China, and has done a considerable amount of writing lately. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you fair give me the creeps. Are you one of these mind readers? No, indeed. Then how in the name of good fortune did you know all this about me? About the manual labor, for example. It's as true as gospel. I begin as a ship's carpenter. Your hands, my dear sir. Your right hand is quite a size larger than your left. The muscles are more developed. As for the Freemasonry... You use an arc and compass breath pin, uh, rather against the strict rules of your order. Oh, I see that. But the writing, how about that? What else can be indicated by that right cuff, so very shiny? And the left sleeve with a smooth patch near the elbow where you rest it on the desk. Well, how about China? The fish that you have tattooed immediately above your right wrist could only have been done in China. That trick of staining the fish's scales a delicate pink is quite peculiar to China. And when, in addition, I see a Chinese coin hanging from your watch chain, the matter becomes even more simple. <laughs> well, I never. <laughs> At first, I thought you'd done something clever. But now I see it was nothing to it after all. I begin to think, Watson, that I make a mistake in explaining. Omni ignotum pro magnifico, you know. Yes. That's what I was thinking. Yes, I'm afraid what reputation I may have will suffer shipwreck if I'm so candid. Uh, have you found the advertisement, Mr. Wilson? Oh, yes, I've got it now. It was in the watch pocket. This is what begin it all, sir. Just read it for yourself. Uh, Watson, uh, suppose you do that for us. With pleasure. Uh, first, uh, make a note of the paper and the date. It's the Morning Chronicle of July the 27th, 1890, just two months ago. Very well. Proceed with the advertisement. It begins, to the Red-Headed League, owing... To the bequest of the late Ezekiah Hopkins, there is now another vacancy open which entitles a member of the League to a salary of four pounds a week for purely nominal services. All red-headed men above the age of 21 are eligible. We are fly in person on Monday at 11 o'clock to Duncan Ross at the offices of the League, 7 Pope Court, Fleet Street. Give me, Holmes. What on earth does this all mean? I think I promised you that this was this case was bizarre. Now, Mr. Wilson, if you will continue with your story. Well, it's just about as I was telling you, Mr. Holmes. I have a small pawnbroker shop in Coburg Square. Of late years, business has been bad. I used to be able to keep two assistants, but now I only have one. And I'd have a job to pay him, except he's willing to come for half wages so as to learn the business. Obliging youth. What's his name? Uh, Vincent Spaulding. <clears throat> and I couldn't want a smarter assistant, Mr. Holmes. I know he could easily earn twice what I'm able to give him. <laughs> well, as I say, if he's satisfied, who am I to be putting ideas into his head? Hmm. Your assistant seems to be as remarkable as your advertisement. Oh, he has only one fault, Mr. Holmes. Photography. Photography? Yes, yeah, snapping away with his camera and then diving down into the cellar like a rabbit into its hole. To develop his pictures. An amateur photographer, huh? He is uh, still with you, I suppose? Oh, yes, sir. And an observant young fellow he is. He was the one who has brought this advertisement to my notice. Hmm. It was just this day, eight weeks, when he rapped on the office door with this very paper in his hand. <laughs> Come in, come in. Oh, Mr. Wilson, sir. Oh, it's you, Vincent. What's the matter? Well, I wish to heaven, Mr. Wilson, that I was a red-headed man. Why? Well, well, look here, sir. 
what it says in this paper. There's another vacancy in the League of the Red-Headed Men. It's worth a pretty penny to him that gets it. A Red-Headed League? Never heard of it. Never heard of the League of the Red-Headed Men? No. Oh, Mr. Wilson, and you eligible for one of the vacancies. Huh? What are they worth? Oh, merely a couple of hundred a year, but the work's slight, and it needn't interfere much with one's regular occupation. Hmm. A couple of hundred pounds a year, huh? Let me see that paper, young man. Yes, sir. Here you are, sir. Uh, as far as I can make out, the league was started by a millionaire named Ezekiah Hopkins, a red-headed man himself. He left his fortune in hands of trustees with instructions to provide easy berths to men who had red hair. Hmm. From what I hear, the work isn't difficult. Oh, oh, there must be millions of red-headed men. Oh, not as many as you might think, sir. You see, it's confined to Londoners. Oh. And then again, it, it, it's, it's no use if your hair is light red or dark red or anything but real blazing fire red. They've got to pick the reddest hair they can find. Well, if there's a redder head of hair than mine in the length and breadth of London, I'd like to see it. Well, I, I have seen a few that I considered oh, redder. Oh, nonsense. Well, where's Matt? Uh, what are you going to do, Mr. I'm Wilson? going around to apply for that vacancy. If it's rain and gold, no one can say that Jabez Wilson is the man to go out with a sieve. <laughs> And did you get the job, Mr. Wilson? I did that, Mr. Holmes. There wasn't a head of hair could touch mine for redness. If I do say so myself. And there was thousands competing. And what was the work? Oh, purely nominal, like the paper said. And it paid four pounds a week, regular as a clock. All I had to do was sit at a desk in an office at that address there from ten to two and copy out bits from the encyclopedia. Hmm. Educational as well as remunerative. And uh, how long did this work continue? About eight weeks. I was pretty well through the A's. Abbots, archery, architecture and the like. Then suddenly it come to an end. I went to my work ten o'clock as usual. The door was shut and locked. And a card was nailed to the door. What did it say? Red-headed league dissolved October 9th. 1890. Hmm. I say, Holmes, that's today. Well, it was this very morning it was, sir. Well, I lost no time trying to find the man that hired me. Four pounds a week is four pounds. You say you tried to find the man that rented the office? Yes, sir. I inquired from the house agent, and he gave me the man's name and said he'd moved to a new address. You went there, of course. Yes, sir. Well? When I got to that address, it was a manufactory of artificial kneecaps. No one had ever heard of the Red-Headed League. So then you came straight to me. Yes, sir. I thought it best to lose no time. Quite right. Uh, by the by, Mr. Wilson, uh, this uh, assistant of yours, Mr. Vincent Spaulding, how long had he been with you when he called your attention to the Red-Headed League? About a month. How did he come? In answer to an advertisement. Uh, was he the only applicant? No, sir. I, I had a dozen. Why did you pick him? Oh, because he was handy and would come cheap. But half wages, in fact. Hmm. What is he like? Hmm. Small, stout built, very quick in his ways. No hair on his face, uh, though he's not short of 30. And he had a white splash of acid on his forehead. I thought as much. Have you ever noticed that his ears are pierced for earrings? Well, yes. He says a gypsy did it for him when he was a lad. Watson, what day of the week is it? Well, Saturday, of course. Saturday, dear me, so it is. Well, Mr. Wilson, I think I may promise you some startling developments by tonight. In the meantime, Watson, I suggest we drop round sometime this afternoon to view the attractions of Saxe Coburg Square and Mr. Wilson's exemplary assistant in particular. Uh, certainly, my dear fellow. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll be expecting you. Goodbye, gentlemen. And now, Watson, if you hand me my violin, I have some thinking to do. Can't you think without that? Oh, all right. There you are. Well, here we are, Holmes. This seems to be Saxe Coburg Square. Mm. 
shabby, genteel little backwater of a place. And this, I fancy, is our friend's shop, the four-story building with the three gilt balls over the door. Yes. Well, the square itself seems fairly uninteresting, huh? Yeah, very depressing. Now, let's see what streets back, backs onto it on this side. Come along, Watson. Well, I can't see what difference the next street can make to our problem. <laughs> if it is a problem, the whole thing sounds more like a practical joke to me. A practical joke which costs its perpetrator four pounds a week? Nonsense, Watson. No man's sense of humor resides in his pocketbook. Well, this street seems to have more life. It's one of the chief arteries leading to the north and west. Now, let me see. What is the order of the houses here? Order? Yes, it's a hobby of mine to have an exact knowledge of London. First we have Mortimer's, then the tobacconist's, the little newspaper shop, the Coburg branch of the City and Suburban Bank, the vegetarian restaurant, and McFarland's carriage building yard. Yes. Now, now we can go back to the shop of our friend, Mr. Wilson. What's the hurry, Holmes? Don't walk so fast. Well, I found out all I want to hear. Well, Holmes, you behave as if you were taking a memory course. Why should you want to know all the shops on that street? Just a waste of time. Nothing that exercises the brain is a waste of time, my dear Watson. The trouble with most of us is that our brains have become flabby from lack of proper use. Rubbish. Well, here we are back again. Quite. Why are you thumping on the pavement with your stick? Huh? You want to enter the shop? Why not knock on the door? Oh, quite so, Watson. I'm afraid my etiquette is a bit faulty lately. So, just to please you, I will knock on the door. Somebody's coming. I can see him through the glass. Looks like our bright little assistant. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Won't you step in? Uh, thank you, no. I only wish to ask you how to get from here to the Strand. Third right, fourth left. Smart fellow, that. Hey, Watson? I see no signs of a colossal intelligence. Nevertheless, he is, in my judgment, the fourth smartest mine in London. And for daring, I'm not sure that he's not the third. I see nothing so startling about him. The knees of his trousers, Watson. Didn't you notice? The knees of his trousers? What about him? Most enlightening, my dear Watson. Most enlightening. Oh, this is so much balderdash. I've had just about enough of it. I'm going to get myself some tea and a muffin. There's an appetizing little baker shop across the road there. Very good, Watson. Suppose you meet me back here at ten tonight. Sharp, mind you. And kindly put your army revolver in your pocket. What? This business is serious. More serious even than I expected. <laughs> Just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes as he endeavors to solve the strange case of the Red-Headed League. Leading hair specialists in this country constantly advise us to take better care of the hair we've got. And men, don't forget that if you want your hair handsome and healthy-looking, one of the first requirements is a hygienic scalp. And why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Kremel hair tonic? Kremel is a highly specialized hair tonic which gives you your money's worth. It contains a unique combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair preparation. It keeps hair attractively groomed at all times, looking so neat and orderly. But Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A Kremel massage stimulates circulation right in the surface of your scalp and leaves your scalp feeling so alive and invigorated. At the same time, Kremel removes dandruff flakes, and it's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer and more pliable. So men, take better care of the hair you've got. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kremel daily for better groomed hair for a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson... You were going to meet Sherlock Holmes that night in saxe coburg Square. Yes, Mr. Bell. Our rendezvous took place right on the dot. I remember the hour was striking. I say, Holmes, it's ten o'clock now. How long do we have to stand here in this confounded rain? I'm soaked to the skin. Until the other member of our party turns up, Watson. Ah, here comes a cab. I think you'll be in it. Whoa! Yes. Good evening, Mr. Merriweather. Good evening, Holmes. Yeah. Uh, I say, Holmes, uh, why have you got to rouse me out on a night like this? Saturday night, too. I shall miss my rubber of whist. 
It's the first Saturday night for seven and twenty years that I've not had my whist. My dear Merriweather, I think you'll find that tonight you're playing for higher stakes than even you are accustomed to. And I can promise the play will be more exciting. Oh, indeed. Uh, by the way, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Uh, how do you do? But come, we must hurry. This way, gentlemen. Where are we going? Wilson's shop is here on the square. You must stop burbling, Watson. Oh, what burbling, Watson. Follow me and don't waste time. In your message to me, Holmes, you said something about John Clay, the murderer, thief, smasher, and forger. John Clay? Who's he? My dear Watson, John Clay is one of our most colorful and dangerous criminals. A young man, but at the head of his uh, profession. I'd rather have the braces on him than on any criminal in London. I've heard that his grandfather was a royal duke. And he himself has been to Eton and Oxford. He'll crack a crib in Scotland one week and be raising money to build an orphanage in Cornwall the next. We've been after him for years, Holmes, and haven't set eyes on him yet. Well, I trust I may have the pleasure of introducing you tonight. Here we are, down this narrow passageway. You'd better let me go first. Look here, Holmes. I don't like the look of all this. This passage goes underground. Gives me the creeps. Oh, ah. I say, let's run into something. Now, the wall, I fancy. I forgot to warn you. There's a turn here to the right. Yes, I found that out. Thanks very much. Ah, here's the door. Just a moment till I light my dark lantern. There. Now, Mr. Merriweather, if you will unlock the door for us. Uh, just a moment till I find my key. Ah, here we are. Better let me go first, sir, in case we're too late. Ah, yes, the coast seems clear enough. Come along, both of you. Oh, as I said, I don't like the look of this place. Your lantern throws such weird shadows. It smells like a vault. It is a vault, my dear Watson. The basement of the city and suburban bank, to be exact, of which our friend Mr. Merriweather here is managing director. Well, what are all those wooden crates doing here? They explain why the most daring criminal in London is taking such an interest in this particular place. Yes, Dr. Watson. These crates contain our French gold. French gold? Quite. Well, you see, we had occasion some months ago to borrow 30,000 Napoleons from France. From France? Good gracious, me! Most of which has never been unpacked. Rather an inducement for any thief. Oh, really, Holmes, I think you are rather unduly excited. The building is guarded by ten burly watchmen. Yes, I dare say you're not particularly vulnerable from above. Nor from below, Holmes. Nothing but solid earth below these flagstones. Listen to this. Don't do that. You want to ruin all our plans? But look here, I say it did sound hollow, you know. Not so loud, please. Now then, I think we'd better take up our positions. You, Merriweather, behind those large boxes in the corner. Watson and I will hide behind this crate. I hope you appreciate the honor, my dear fellow. This crate contains no less than 2,000 Napoleons neatly packed in tinfoil. Good heavens. Ready? We must put the screen over my dark lantern. And sit here in the dark? Certainly. Oh, dear, and I brought along a pack of cards. I thought we might have time for a three-handed rubber. Not tonight, Mr. Merriweather. We are dealing with a dangerous man, and unless we can take him at a disadvantage, he may do us considerable harm. One thing more. When I flash my light, close in swiftly. And if he reaches for a weapon, shoot. And shoot to kill. Dear me, I... I wish I'd stayed at home. Quite. I'm going to cover the light. here in the dark like this. Really, Merriweather. Holmes, do you hear that? Look, 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 look. There in the middle of the floor, a slit of light. Somebody's raising one of those stone slabs. Look, look, there's a hand. Catch his hand before I can pull himself through the opening. Right you are. Wait, Watson. Look out, he's got a knife. Take your hands off. No, you don't, you... Oh, oh well done, Holmes. Well done. You've knocked him out. Good. Drag him up here. Right you are. There. Now, Mr. Merriweather, if you'll give us some light. That's better. But I say, Holmes, it's Vincent Spaulding, Wilson's assistant. Spaulding rubbish. This is John Clay, one of the most dangerous criminals in London. I've been after him for years. Help me search him, Watson. Look oh. out, Holmes. Look out. Oh. He's coming, too. Take your filthy hands off me, you scarecrow. No, no, no. None of that now. You may not be aware that I have royal blood in my veins. Oh, lunatic. 
And when you address me, have the goodness to say, sir, and please. Oh, very well. Would you please, sir, march yourself upstairs where we can hand you over to the policemen who are anxiously awaiting your highness's arrival? And be quick about it. <laughs> Better have another spot of whiskey, Watson. Oh, thank you. Hi, uh, Jervis. Feels good to get into dry clothes again after spending hours in that cold cellar. I say, said it, not so much soda, Holmes. Do you want to drown it? Oh, <laughs> God bless you, my dear fellow. Oh, thanks. I say, Holmes, wh- when did you first begin to suspect that fellow Spaulding? I, I mean, Claire. When uh, Mr. Wilson told me he was anxious to work for half price. Always suspect anyone or anything that comes too cheap. There's sure to be a motive behind yes, but it. How did you guess what the motive was in this case, I mean? I suspected his uh, fondness for photography and his trick of vanishing into the cellar. The cellar. There was the end of this tangled clue. And why was someone so anxious to have our friend Mr. Wilson kept out of his shop for several hours every day? Activities in the cellar again. Uh, by the way, that red-headed league hoax is one of the cleverest dodges I've come across for some time... Too clever, in fact. When I heard of it, I knew there was only one man who could have originated it. John Clay. We've had our skirmishes, but this is the first time we've come face to face. Well, so he went round to have a look at the shop. At his trousers, Watson. Trousers? At the mm. knees of his trousers, to be exact. You saw how worn and wrinkled they were? They spoke of hours of burrowing. Burrowing in the cellar. But what for? By tapping on the pavement, I found that the tunnel did not stretch out to the front. Where, then? We strolled round the corner, you remember. And there stood the city and suburban bank, abutting on our friend's pawn shop. Yes, of course. The inference was clear. Yes, yes, I see that. But how did you guess that he'd make his attempt tonight? Perfectly simple, Watson. Perfectly simple. The offices of the Red-Headed League closed this morning. Mr. Wilson's absence was no longer necessary. The tunnel was completed, but it was essential that Mr. Clay should use it soon or it might be discovered. Tonight being Saturday would be ideal, as it would give him two days for escape. Q.E.D. Holmes, your reasoning is perfect. A long chain, and yet every link rings true. Well, it saves me from ennui. These little problems help me to escape the common places of existence. Yes, uh, after all, uh, l'homme c'est rien, l'oeuvre c'est tout. As Flaubert once wrote to George Sand... Fascinating story, Dr. Watson. What a thrilling time you must have had during the days you lived with Sherlock Holmes. Well, I can't say that I was ever bored. (laughs) I should think not. Ladies, how often you've heard it said that a woman's hair is her crowning glory. And how true this is. That's why you ladies should take the very best care of your hair, especially in shampooing. I'm glad you brought that point up, Mr. Bell, because many popular shampoos have a tendency to dry the hair. Well, here's one shampoo that will never dry the hair, never under any circumstances, and it's Cremel shampoo. Yes, Cremel shampoo is simply wonderful. It actually glamour bays each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural, glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays this way for days. Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a caustic soap. It's not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. Cremel shampoo whips up a luxurious, active foam, even in the hardest water. You can use it as often as you wish over a long period of time, and it'll never dry your hair. In fact, Cremel shampoo has a built-in oil base which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Remember, ladies, that divinely beautiful Powers models wash their hair with Cremel shampoo. They claim no other shampoo leaves their hair more shining bright, yet never dries the hair. Why not try it? K-R-E-M-L, Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me think. Well, Mr. Bell... One of the favorite fictional problems of your modern mystery writer is the so-called locked room story. (laughs) Yes, I know. Somebody gets murdered in a sealed room, locked from the inside, and the detective has an awful time finding out how it was done. Quite correct, Mr. Bell, quite correct. And uh, next week, 
I'm going to tell you how, just ten years before the turn of the century, Holmes actually encountered such a problem and solved it. I call the story Murder in the Locked Room. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Red-Headed Leaf. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of Universal International Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell, speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo. Inviting you to be with us next week at the same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about murder in the locked room. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Welcome back. You know, I like this portrayal, and particularly the characterization of uh, Jabez Wilson. It really brings home, I, I think, the uh, psychological cleverness of John Clay, who seems to be kind of a uh, forerunner of uh, Moriarty. I mean, I, I could imagine that if Jabez Stone lived in modern times, he'd be the type to be taken in by the uh, Nigerian email scam. And of course, this episode's not the first time that Sherlock Holmes has commented on the uh, perils of describing how he knows what he uh, knows about a particular case or individual. If he doesn't tell us, and he's just told us everything about ourselves, we might think he's got special powers which could have advantages at times. But when it's neatly uh, explained, it seems to have the effect of people going, well, well, that was obvious. To Holmes, yes. But a few people other than Holmes have the discipline to pick up all those pieces and uh, form a correct image of what's going on. All right, well, we have a couple quick comments off of Podcast Alley's. Uh, you guys are the best. I listen almost every day. Uh, when I take my daily walk, keep up the good work from John G. Uh, uh, hey, Adam, here's my vote. You're still doing a great job. I'm still as impressed uh, as ever, says John uh, Castle. And then uh, just a simple love it from Greg Russ. Well, thank you for your kind comments. Appreciate all the support this month in Podcast Alley as we uh, continue to be in the top ten. Uh, if you've got a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Remember, every month, cast your vote uh, for the show on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net, and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.